Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, introduction and thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, for me to come here. So this is a somewhat uh, unusual uh, forum, but uh, as we progress, uh, we uh, need to find a way to look into the future. And today I'd like to address to you about the future of the Morse law. So Morse law is one of the most fundamental uh, uh, law in our information age, uh, which led to the prosperity of our information age and in particular to the Silicon Valley. But we all have been wondering uh, what will be happening to the future of this law. Can the progress uh, occur at the same pace as we uh, witnessed in the past? And uh, uh, there's actually uh, some very exciting, revolutionary, scientific uh, progress that has been made. And I'd like to use the opportunity today to uh, share with you. So we all know Moore's law, which states that the number of transistors on a semiconductor chip doubles about every 18 months. Uh, and so does the overall computational power uh, of, the, of the devices. Uh, so it has been uh, formulated by Gordon Moore back in the 60s, and over the past few decades, it has been one of the most amazing law in our information age. Uh, so as the semiconductor technology progressed, uh, we were able to double the number of transistors on a semiconductor chip every uh, 18 months uh, or so. Uh, but there's every indication that the Morse law may come to a standstill uh, because over the past uh, few decades, uh, we basically have been pushing the technological progress, but based on more or less the same scientific principles. Uh, what uh, will be needed uh, for the future is really a new scientific uh, revolution of the significance comparable to that of the discovery of the transistor, the silicon, and the uh, uh, integrated uh, circuit. So in order to understand uh, why Moore's law might be coming to a standstill, uh, let's look at, uh, so I'm a, a physics professor, and so we look, try to look at the world in its most fundamental and basic constituents. So there are two elementary particles uh, that are uh, responsible for the progress of the information age. One on the left is the photon, and one on the right, uh, or photon, which is the basic quantum of the light. And uh, on the right, we see the electron, which is the basic unit for the electrical current uh, conduction. So photon is responsible for communication. Electron is responsible for computation. Why is, uh, why is this so? Uh, because the photon interacts rather weakly uh, with each other. And because of this property, we can pack a lot of photons into uh, fiber optical uh, cables. And because they interfere with each other or interact with each other rather weakly, uh, they can actually propagate through a vast distances without much uh, dissipation. And that's why uh, we use them for communication. But because they interact uh, with each other rather weakly, it's very hard to manipulate them. And that's why we don't use them for computation. On the other hand, we have the electron, uh, which is circling around the atomic uh, nucleus, and they actually interact with each other very strongly. And uh, that's why when you pass electrical current through a wire, it uh, dissipates very quickly. That's the bad news. But the good news is that because they interact with, the, uh, with each other very strongly, it's easy to, easy to manipulate them and to con uh, construct logic devices. So that's why there's this uh, dichotomy of having these two uh, fundamental elementary particles, one responsible for communication and the other responsible for computation. Uh, but the problem with computation is that uh, because they interact very strongly, it also leads to a lot of dissipation. So if we want to look at the fundamental ro uh, roadblock uh, of uh, the progress of the Moore's law, it turns out to be the problem of power dissipation. You all have this annoying feeling that when you put the laptop on your lap, it feels burning hot. And that's, uh, so as we progress to more and more advanced technological nodes, uh, as the feature size on a semiconductor chip gets smaller and smaller, the problem of power dissipation gets more and more severe. So now, how do we understand this? Why does this uh, come to be? And that's basically because you have this wonderful electron, which is almost like a Ferrari, 
but they are pushing the Ferrari through a crowded marketplace. So as it goes through this crowded marketplace, it's scattering with each other, scattering with the cloud. It just, all the energy you push onto the electron gets dissipated very quickly, and that dissipation shows up as heat, and because you're making the semiconductors smaller and smaller, it becomes very hard to extract this heat out, and so that's why uh, as we go to smaller and smaller uh, feature size on a semiconductor chip, uh, it becomes, uh, the problem becomes almost insurmountable. So you may think that if this is really the analogy, so we can understand a lot of science just by analogy, uh, then the natural uh, answer to this question is to build a highway system for the electron. So if you have a highway system for the electron, it has a basic principle of a spatial separation of opposite moving traffic, as we see on this uh, figure on the right. So you have two uh, oppositely going lanes, and on the right-hand side, uh, all the cars are moving forward, and on the left-hand side, all the cars are moving backward. It's a picture totally opposite to those on the right, a chaotic, disorderly uh, motion, uh, and this will be uh, the chip, uh, you will say, in the future. How can we m really make the electron move as if there are cars on a highway? So that will be the future, uh, but unfortunately, what we have today uh, is what we see on the left. Uh, the electron, uh, even in the most advanced semiconductor chip, the electron are just moving completely randomly, and in the process of doing so, it's dissipating tremendous amount of heat. So the good news I'd like to share with you is the exciting discovery in science that it turns out that it's indeed possible through the basic interactions of the electron to construct such a highway system uh, for the electron and thereby offering the hope to save the Moore's law. So now this, uh, the problem uh, with the Moore's law is certainly a crisis that we're all facing, but at the same time, it can be an opportunity. Uh, going back to uh, 50 years ago, it was William Shockley who uh, discovered, one of the co-discoverers of uh, semicondu uh, semiconductor and transistor, uh, who came to Stanford University into a physics department, uh, introduced the transistor, and generation after generation, we have perfected uh, the semiconductor uh, technology. And it was this basic discovery uh, that gave rise to the tremendous prosperity uh, in the Silicon Valley, which becomes the uh, uh, kind of the center of innovation uh, around the world. So, uh, but now uh, we have this uh, crisis, uh, but at the same time, it's also offering an opportunity. And that wisdom is deeply encoded already in the Chinese culture and Chinese language. So when we say crisis, uh, Wei Ji, uh, the, the very word of crisis already means at the same time, it's a crisis, and at the same time, it is also an opportunity. So, it's, uh, so for the first time, basically, after 50 years of this rapid progress, we can no longer just rely on the technological progress to push uh, the information age forward. We also need scientific discoveries. And that's the excitement I'd like to share with you uh, today. So basically, uh, we discovered a new set of materials uh, which goes under the name of topological uh, insulator materials, uh, where the electrons are moving exactly in this uh, highway uh, principle that they get uh, spatial separation of uh, oppositely uh, moving traffic. So, how, so let, just bear with me, and I'd like to explain to you very briefly uh, how this uh, comes about. So imagine you have a single wire on the upper uh, left, so even if you have a single wire and the electrons have still two ways of motion, it can move forward or it can move uh, backwards. So let's imagine I have some impurities uh, somewhere on the wire, then the electron originally uh, moving forward will be scattered back and that will cause resistance and will cause a dissipation. So the idea is to build a highway system so that these two oppositely moving traffic are not confined into the single wire, but they are confined to the two opposite edges of a two-dimensional uh, uh, material. For example, the forward moving uh, traffic will be going forward, and the backward moving traffic will be going uh, backward. Uh, at the, the lower part of the sample, the uh, electron will be going backward, and then in this case, when they scatter into something, uh, they will simply uh, go around and not uh, be uh, perturbed. But so looking at this picture, you may wonder how would the electron possibly know how to do that, because there seems to be a sense 
uh, that the electron on the upper edge will be going forward and on the lower edge will going uh, uh, backwards. Why don't the electron on the upper edge going backwards and uh, vice versa? And the reason uh, how to realize this is uh, through a very intense external magnetic field, and then the electrons inside will be going around in circles, but on the edge, they cannot completely uh, form a circle, so they will be skipping and they will be keep on moving uh, forward. So it will be the external magnetic field which gives the electrons a sense. So this was a very, very important discovery in basic science, and was twice awarded uh, recognized by the Nobel Prizes for this uh, discovery. But unfortunately, it's not practical because it requires a very high magnetic field. So in my own work, uh, we uh, developed the idea that we can get rid of this external magnetic field by looking at another basic property of the electron, namely the fact that the electron has a spin in addition to its charge. So when we try to understand uh, basic science, uh, a lot of times analogy helps a tremendous amount. And the, reason, the way the electron moves is very much like the way Earth moves around the sun. So the Earth moves around the sun in its common center of mass uh, and goes around the sun once a year, but it also spins by itself. And by spinning by itself, it gives us a day uh, or 24 hours. And the electron also have these two uh, kind of motions. And the internal uh, spinning degree of freedom of the electron can play the role similar to that of the external magnetic field in giving the electron a basic sense of motion. And actually, this uh, very wonderful effect uh, was predicted by Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. So then it gave rise to the possibility that using the internal compass of the electron, it's a spinning degree of freedom, uh, it gave rise to this wonderful way of motion that the electron can move in this uh, 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 in well-defined lengths, which are spatially uh, separated with each other, and they cannot possibly uh, make a U-turn and going backwards. So this was the scientific idea, but uh, now also uh, you may wonder whether this has been realized in uh, labs, and indeed it has been. And unlike all the previous discoveries uh, in science, a lot of times the discoveries are made by people working very hard in the lab, and they discover something serendipitously. But this time, uh, we're very well guided by the theory, and uh, we actually, it was my group, which can predict the first uh, topological insulator material. And it's, um, uh, so this is a chart of all possible binary semiconductors, uh, but on the lower right, you see there's a material called mercury terrorite, which first realized this effect. So uh, basically, why are something behaving like metals and something like insulators? Uh, if you have, uh, so uh, it's very much like this hourglass, that if you feel uh, up to certain partially filled uh, levels, and then when you tilt, uh, uh, yeah, I cannot go back, so, but, but somehow, uh, so when you tilt, uh, the electron will be able to start to move. And this is like uh, you, when you have uh, a container uh, with partially filled water level, the water will be able to uh, move from right to left, and that's the principle of a metal. And the principle of an insulator is basically like a filled uh, bottle or a completely empty bottle, and then in this case, no matter how you tilt, uh, the electron will not be able to move around. But this uh, wonderful material called topological insulator has the property that it's filled uh, the bottom and empty top, but in the middle, uh, as if they're connected uh, to each other, and that gives rise to a possible flow uh, on the surface only. And so we're also predicting new materials uh, which can realize this wonderful effect at room temperature. And uh, some of you may have heard about the material called graphene, which is a single sheet of carbon, uh, but we are predicting new materials of a single sheet atomic layer made completely out of tin, and that gives rise to uh, this wonderful effect at uh, room temperature. And uh, there are now also more uh, materials on, uh, which are mostly discovered on the lower right-hand side of the periodic table, which has this uh, strong effect of spin coupling to the orbital motion. Uh, so now let me uh, just uh, tell you very briefly why this material is called uh, topological insulator. Uh, basically, in uh, mathematics, uh, we have uh, uh, previously understood that uh, there are geometrical shapes which are particularly beautiful and uh, because of their symmetry. And these are called platonic solids, and they're beautiful 
because they have this uh, very high symmetry associated with them. But sometimes this kind of beauty is also fragile. If you move the one corner uh, of the uh, solid, or if you uh, add an edge or add a face, uh, usually the symmetry can be destroyed. But there's another uh, concept uh, which uh, refers to uh, topo topology, uh, which is basically a combination uh, defining, so no matter what, how these uh, shapes look like, uh, you can take any uh, uh, polyhedron, and uh, if you uh, construct the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces, it's always a number equals to two. And that's the idea called topology, that it's invariant under how we uh, change uh, these uh, polyhedra. So uh, in the case of topological insulator, uh, the basic... Uh, The basic degree of freedom is the number of lanes on a highway, which will always remain invariant uh, how you change uh, the system. So uh, another way to illustrate this wonderful material is that in the bulk, it's uh, uh, insulating, but on the surface, it's conducting. But you may say, oh, this is not so surprising because we know, for example, the Chinese porcelains, uh, which are insulating in the bulk, but you can coat them with a metallic surface. But in those materials, when it reacts with the atmosphere, the coating can very quickly disappear. But in the case of topological insulator, uh, it has a conducting surface, but no matter how they react with the atmosphere, uh, it, you can push that conducting surface up or down, but uh, it will always remain there. And that's the wonderful idea uh, called uh, topology uh, that uh, protects uh, this uh, uh, property of this material. So now that we have uh, discovered this uh, basic material and we're still pushing uh, the scientific envelope uh, so that uh, we can realize this uh, system in a more uh, kind of manufacturing-friendly fashion, we can have uh, them to uh, become the basic wirings of semiconductors, which dissipates almost no energy. So on the left uh, is a standard body for semiconductor industry called International Technology Roadmap for, for Semiconductors, and they already recommended this new scientific discovery to be the future of uh, semiconductors uh, that can solve the problem of dissipation and keep the Moore's law going. So for this uh, mobile conference, uh, you all, so one thing uh, when you have a laptop, the annoying thing is that you, when you put them on your lap, it feels burning hot. The annoying thing you have uh, with your mobile device is the battery uh, constantly goes out. And that's all because of the uh, tremendous amount of dissipation which is currently going on inside the semiconductor chip. So when our technology becomes ready, I can assure you that you will have a telephone, uh, you will have a mobile phone which can last for weeks or even months uh, on a single charge. So that could be a revolutionary uh, a new, uh, <coughs> new scientific discovery pushing uh, the technology. It also has a wonderful property that it can turn waste heat into useful energy. And so lastly, uh, which is really the, uh, the, the, the most exciting frontier uh, of science and technology, uh, is that the current computers we have uh, all uh, computes in some sense very slowly. For example, uh, it can, uh, if I give you a number 15, it's very easy for a computer to break that apart into three times five. But if I give you a very, very large number, uh, the classical computers are very, very difficult to determine whether this large number is composed of the product of two factors or just an uh, 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 intrinsically large number. But so with, the, this, uh, with these new materials, we can make quantum computers which make this computation very easy. So this will, uh, I will be coming to my uh, last slide. So as we gather here in the Silicon Valley, uh, looking to the future, but it's also useful to look into the past. So basically, when we look into the past, into the entire human civilization, basically the materials has played a very, very, uh, maybe the most important role, because all the basic human epochs are defined by the materials uh, we use at the time. For example, the Stone Age, uh, and uh, the wonderful age uh, was the Chinese bronzes, uh, defining the Bronze Age, and then we move into the Iron Age, and then eventually into the Silicon Age. So you see uh, important generations of uh, important chapters in human civilization are all defined by the materials we use. And uh, we are coming to uh, an end of the Silicon Age, and with the discovery of this new uh, set of materials, uh, maybe we can push 
the future is still bright uh, with uh, Moore's law and uh, with the discovery of these new materials and a new principle for the electrons to move in a coordinated highway fashion uh, could point to an exciting future and we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. Thank you all very much.